everybody. Uh, my name is Robin Rowley. Hi, I'm uh, Joseph Rovens. And we're going to talk to you today about change and the process of change. As you can see, the title of our talk is How Things Change with Chaos. Change is a really weird uh, uh, thing to be talking about because it's not a thing. It's change is actually a process. And in order to be able to really understand change, um, basically you've got to look at the dynamics of change. And one of the best um, sources for understanding that is chaos theory. So we're going to show you um, something now which gives you a clue about chaos and chaos theory and what we mean by it. So check this out. That's the uh, Mandelbrot set, a, a fractal from the Mandelbrot set. That's right, yeah. That's called a Mandelbrot set. When we talk about chaos, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about actually about a structure which exists deep within some kind of self-organizing, non-linear, chaotic system. Uh, we're talking about weather systems. We're talking about traffic systems. We're talking about human systems. And we're talking about the, the dynamics, the process of change and transformation based upon chaos theory. So um, our title is How Things Change with Chaos. And what you can see from this fractal is that from the outside it may look as if it is messy, as if it is a lot of randomness. But when you look more carefully, more closely, you notice there is order in it. And with chaos theory, you actually learn to see the order in things that you thought were messy or looked messy uh, at, at the beginning. Google the word fractal yourself when you get time. Uh, that's called a Mandelbrot set, the thing you're looking at at the moment. And it's named after a, a researcher called Benoit Mandelbrot, um, who developed that, that particular fractal uh, quite a long time ago now, but uh, it's very beautiful. And if you look at it closely, you'll see there are patterns within it which are very similar, but nothing is exactly the same. Okay, and it repeats, uh, and it repeats, and it repeats, uh, but like every leaf on a tree is different, or every snowflake that, that descends to the earth is different, apart from each snowflake has six dendrites, but apart from that, by the time they hit the earth, every snowflake is totally different. And that's, it's a very um, 21st century view of science, and we'll be talking about that uh, later on. So um, that's a kind of a brief introduction to what we mean by the word chaos. Chaos is not a mess. Chaos is actually a pattern of order with, which exists deep within the system. Okay, and the picture of the Mandelbrot set, I think, illustrates that. Mm -hmm. Now, when, also when you're talking about change, you, you get into some really weird stuff. So I'm, we're going to show you something else now, right? Um, and this is called the Merbius Strip. So the paradox of change, we've got the Merbius Strip. Um, and we're going to show you how to do that. That's a, this is a Merbius Strip here. This is a, a physical manifestation of it. So I'm going to show you how to make one of these things. And you might try this yourself. This is a, some people go a bit kind of strange when they see this. You take a piece of paper and you hold it so that you've got th three fingers pointing up, three fingers pointing down, and then you give it one twist like that. And then you bring the ends together. And Joe, maybe you can help me on this. Okay. If you can stick that down with a bit of sellotape there. Okay, so what we're looking at now is this, this piece of paper that's got one twist in it. Now, I'm going to ask you to, that's, that's the way to do it. I'm going to ask you to draw a line down one side. So if you, if, you, if you take a pen and you start to draw a line down one side,
very quickly, you're going to see this weird kind of geometrical shape that you've got. And I think, I hope we can see that with the camera. Uh, you'll see that it's actually drawing, it's only got one side because the line comes round and round and round and it comes back upon itself. So what you're looking at here is what we would call, it's a paradox. It's a geometrical paradox because you've got, a two, it's got one side. So it's, it's a two dimensional object in a three dimensional space. Now, let's go a bit further. This is the kind of stuff you have to get into if you really want to start to understand change. You take a pair of scissors and you cut down the middle of this Merbius strip. So we're cutting down our line. Here you can see, cutting down the line. So now cut. I'm going to save the last cut until the end. Okay, now I haven't finished the cut yet, but you can see I've cut it. Now, what does your, what do you expect to happen on the last cut? So, what does your logical mind say is going to happen on the last cut? Okay, so let's cut it, right? So you see it like that. We're going to make the last cut. Bingo. Surprise, surprise. It does not split and separate, right? What actually happens is the Mobius strip, this, this geometrical paradox, this weird kind of object, right? Um, what does it do? It actually divides itself, it replicates, um, and it would continue to do so if you, if you kept cutting. Um, what it is, is actually, it's a, a geometrical representation of a hologram. A hologram, each part of a hologram contains uh, uh, the sum of all the information of the whole. So if you look on your bank card and you've got your holographic picture of Beethoven or whoever's on your uh, bank card, and it seems to move, the eyes follow you as you move your head, the way they put those together, this is 21st century science, is each tiny part of that hologram contains millions and millions of little Beethovens, okay? It contains uh, all parts of the whole. That's a hologram. Now, so each part of the hologram holds all the information of the whole, and it's built up that way. This is a weird way of thinking. But this is the way you have to start to think when you're looking at change. Now, uh, let's now look at, we've got the Mobius strip, Okay, which has got the implicate side, the side that's, that, that the information is within, that we can't see on this side, the implicit, um, but we've also got the explicit. We've got the side, that, the, the information that you can actually see. Okay, and let's compare that to, to um, a model that is much older. This goes back, I think, to the 18th century. This one goes back thousands of years. This is the Chinese symbol of change, and this is yin and yang. This is the yin-yang symbol of, of, uh, of change. And it, essentially, as you can see, each section contains a part of the whole. Okay? And when you look at it, there is a, there, there is a similarity between the Merbius strip okay, and the yin-yang symbol. And that is the Chinese symbol of change. It's the I Ching, okay? That's the, the or the, the symbol of yin and yang. Um, each part contains a part of the whole. That's the, kind, that's the kind of thinking we had to get into, Joseph and I, way back 22 years ago, in 1994, when we started to have a look at the, the change process. How do things change in nature? So we looked at the, uh, some of the paradoxes, some of the complexities around change. Now we're going to look at change itself and see if we can come up with a definition of it and uh, possibly then lead on to uh, producing a model of change. So here we've got the yin-yang symbol of change. And now we're going to look at change itself. What is change? So 
all living systems are a balance between order and chaos. It's, uh, that's, um, the quote there is from Ilya Prigogine, a, a Nobel Prize winning chemist, um, Belgian, originally Russian. Uh, Joseph and I met him and we worked with him in 1997. He's now gone, God bless him, he was uh, very kind to us and uh, um, he influenced our work quite a lot. He's the grandfather of chaos theory as far as we're concerned. Um, so that quote from him, all living systems contain a mix of both order and chaos. Um, that may be a new idea to you guys, but basically um, when you look at the, at the science of this, it's like order and chaos are absolutely ubiquitous. They are everywhere in the universe and they are in all living systems. There's a balance between the two. Um, it's like looking, if you don't consider chaos, it's like looking at an airplane and saying which is more important, the left wing or the right wing of an aircraft, okay? So the two things go together here. Um, and we're dealing with a balance between order and chaos. So can we, can we get to a definition then of what change is? And here we go. Change then is where you basically upset that balance. You upset the balance. You push the system or the, the environment changes to push the system from a, an ordered state into a state of chaos um, or vice versa. Okay, so it's a balance between order and chaos. If we, can, if we can take that as a definition then, what is change? Change upsets the balance between order and chaos. That's our kind of uh, fundamental definition. And as a, as a student, we can also think about a good balance between all the things you know, you know and you can do, and some of the things you do not know yet or cannot do yet. How do you learn? Well, when the part of the not knowing and the things extra you need to learn becomes bigger, upsetting the balance, and then you learn, uh, learn something new. Okay, so now we come on to the, the question of um, if change then is a balance between order and chaos, why do things change? And more often than not, it's because everything is embedded in its environment. Every living system or even non-living system uh, exists in an environment. When the environment changes, essentially, you've got to change just to stay the same. And that paradox comes from Fritz of Capra. Um, and that's, uh, change is not something, particularly in the 21st century, it's not a luxury. Um, basically, you have to change just to stay the same. And when we use the word change, we do not mean updates. Updates is what marketing does when it brings out the same washing product but calls it new, or when a new iPhone comes up. It's not a fundamental transformation or change of the thing, it's just an update. No. What we mean is real fundamental change that really fits into a new context or creates a new context. And we as humans uh, are equipped to notice when it's just an update, because we sometimes even get upset when there are too many updates. But when there's fundamental change, we also notice, yes, that's the direction uh, we should be getting into. Like, for example, the internet, which is something that uh, 20 years ago wasn't around as much as it is today. But today we consider it the most normal thing most normal way of communicating and uh, doing business with each other. And the key word there is the word Joseph just used, which is transformation, okay? And that's the kind of change we are talking about. We're not talking about adaptation or doing more of the same. We're talking about a fundamental transformation in the system or in the species or in the organization uh, or in the country. Um, so a, totally, uh, a total transformation, it's transformational change. That, that's what we're about. Okay, great. Now, um, essentially, then, why do things change? We're going to show you. Uh, we're going to show you another little model. Okay, Joe. Maybe if I can have your chair for a moment. Sure. Okay. This also we got from Professor Prigogine. He said basically. Okay. <laughs> Could you give me something flatter? Oh, yeah, that was 
Okay, I got it, I got it. It's okay, we're good. Thanks, gentlemen, sorry about that. Okay, he said basically, you've got two types of systems. You've got a fixed rigid system, and you've got some system which is more free and is more flexible. Now, from the outside, both systems are in equilibrium. They are in an environment. At the moment, the environment is stable. It's not changing much, right? But imagine now that the winds of change start to blow through the environment. They start to blow through, and each of these separate systems starts to move from equilibrium. So the equilibrium is disturbed in this system, and the equilibrium is disturbed in that system. And what, what it reveals is the system on the left is far less robust than the system on the right, because the system on the right has the ability, it's free and it's flexible. Flexibility means it, it can resonate at different frequencies. It can move at other frequencies. This other system is rigid and it's fixed. And basically what you're looking at there is, is it a, 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 a fixed platform or is it a free pendulum system? Okay, so you can see that now. And what we're looking at is how do you actually organize for a change? So the fixed platform, this is a, a, a metaphor for a top-down, fixed, rigid, hierarchical type of organization. This is a better metaphor for a modern 21st century Google organization, which is self-organizing, which is bottom-up. Okay, so it's a self-organizing system. When the environment of Google changes, Google is probably, if it's not leading the changes, there are a thousand minds in Google that are well aware of the changes, and they're already busy with it. They're already working on it. Whereas in a hierarchy, when something changes, the last person to find out about it is the guy at the top. Because they, they're only using one mind. Google are using 10,000 or 20,000 minds. Okay, all working on looking at the environment, busy with the environment. That's the metaphor. So here we can see, um, although they were both in equilibrium, one system is a lot more robust than the other. And in fact, what we're looking at here is the difference between a hierarchical system, which is very efficient. If we're making a million components of the same thing, time after time after time, hierarchy is a very good way of organizing to do that. Whereas if we're, but if we're trying to be creative and come up with something new to reinvent the future, okay, then the network type of organization, this flexible system of organization, is actually far more effective. So thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed that. We've been trying.